tonight. Pleading for peace. Israel's Netanyahu seems unconvinced on any new suggestions made by negotiating nations on a potential ceasefire in Gaza. The crisis continues to see escalation as talks drag on. Keeping tally. Ukraine releases official statistics of casualties in the conflict as the nation struggles to fight back against invading Russian forces. Haley's hopes. With a crushing defeat in her home state of South Carolina, the presidential hopeful looks on to Michigan, despite polls already showing her in big trouble, as a clear favorite Donald Trump charges full steam ahead. And a pearlescent night. The Screen Actors Guild Awards celebrates its pearl anniversary with the likes of Oppenheimer dominating the wins. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News at the start of a fresh week. I'm wishing you nothing but productivity up ahead. So let's take you right to the latest updates on key stories from across the globe. Starting off with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Netanyahu says the ceasefire deal would only somewhat delay the Israeli military offensive in Rafah. A six-week pause is fight in fighting is being negotiated currently to allow for the release of hostages and prisoners and the delivery of aid into Gaza. But some results don't seem too convincing. U.S., Egyptian, Qatari and Israeli negotiators are said to have reached an understanding on the basic outline of a hostage deal during talks in Paris. More talks with Hamas are needed, but according to a U.S. national security advisor, negotiators are cautiously optimistic. However, even as the two sides appeared to edge closer to a temporary ceasefire agreement, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said a hostage deal with Hamas would not stop the Israeli invasion of Rafah. In Gaza, with food scarce, people have become reliant on a weed known as common mallow to feed their families. The plant has medicinal properties and grows freely in harsh, dry soil conditions. It has now become the main staple due to there being no alternative. The UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA, which last delivered food to northern Gaza on the 23rd of January, called for more aid to be let in to avert famine. Over in Ukraine now, President Volodymyr Zelensky said 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed since Russia's full-scale invasion two years ago, giving the first official figure in more than a year. With the anniversary of the conflict just passed, Ukraine seems to be outgunned and outnumbered, despite the West rallying behind the nation. At the end of 2022, a presidential aide reported that 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers had been killed. Zelensky's tally differs sharply from what the New York Times reported in August when it cited U.S. officials as saying that close to 70,000 Ukrainian soldiers had been killed. The same report said that as many as 120,000 Russian troops had died during the war. Zelensky on Sunday told reporters that 180,000 Russians had been killed in the fighting. Russia does not disclose military losses, which it regards as a secret. Both sides regularly describe the other's military losses as vast. Battlefield casualties are a highly sensitive subject in Ukraine, which is trying to reform how it mobilizes civilians to join its armed forces after last year's counteroffensive failed to break through Russian lines. Zelensky said that that plan had been leaked to Russia. Russian forces will attempt another offensive in late May or summer, Zelensky said, adding that Ukraine has a new plan for a counteroffensive, details of which he could not disclose publicly. Meanwhile, the Biden administration recently announced trade restrictions on 93 entities from various countries, including China, for their support to Russia in the Ukraine conflict. According to the Chinese Commerce Ministry, China has strongly opposed the U.S. sanctions imposed on Chinese companies for their involvement with Russia. The ministry stated on its website that China will take necessary measures to protect the rights and interests of its enterprises. These restrictions essentially prohibit U.S. shipments to targeted cities, including eight Chinese companies. 
The sanctions come on the eve of the second anniversary of Russia's Ukraine invasion. China's foreign ministry spokesperson Mao Ning called for an objective and impartial position on the Ukraine crisis and stated China worked actively to promote peace talks. She further said that they have not sat idly by still less exploited the situation for selfish gains. Moreover, Ukraine officials and media reports have also accused China of supplying key electronics and dual-use technologies including drone components to Russia's military since its invasion of Ukraine 2 years ago. However, Beijing has denied their claim. Trade between the US and China in 2023 fell for the first time since 2019 by 11% to US dollars 664 billion according to customs data. According to the Commerce Department, the US imported more goods from Mexico than China for the first time in 20 years. On the road to the White House tonight, expect the expected, I guess, because Nikki Haley said she is not giving up the fight even after losing the Republican primary in her home state on Saturday. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump said he is already wishing for the general election. Tonight, Nikki Haley not backing down. I'm a woman of my word. Yeah! I'm not giving up this fight. Donald Trump's sole rival sticking in the race, defiant. and barreling into Michigan even after an historic loss in her home state of South Carolina last night and i'm grateful that today is not the end of our story trump meanwhile full steam ahead an even bigger win than we anticipated and ignoring the primary and already wishing for the general election you know, in certain countries you're allowed to call your election date If I had the right to do it, I'd do it tomorrow. He's preparing the party for that too, seeking to install family members and allies to run the Republican National Committee. The next stretch of voting states looming large, Michigan followed by Super Tuesday a week later. Most of those winner take all states, making it tough for Haley to earn delegates unless she actually wins the state. Haley hitting nearly a dozen states in the next 10 days and seeing reason to keep going. I know 40% is not 50%. <laughs> But I also know 40% is not some tiny group. And independent voters, even those who ultimately opted for Trump. Let's go in for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with more key stories. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back. We're in neighboring India now as the Indian Railways has ordered an investigation after a freight train traveled more than 70 kilometers without drivers. Video shared on social media showed the train zooming past several stations at very high speeds. Reports say the train ran without a driver from Katwa in Jammu and Kashmir to Hoshiarpur district in Punjab. The railway says the train was brought to a halt and no one was hurt. Officials stated that the incident took place between 7:25 a.m. and 9:00 a.m. local time yesterday. The 53 wagon train carrying chip stones was on its way to Panja from Jammu when it stopped in Katua for a change in crew. Officials say it began moving down a slope on the railway tracks after the train driver and his assistant got off. Officials say the train moved at a speed of nearly 100 kilometers per hour and managed to cross about five stations before it was stopped. Soon after being alerted about the moving train, officials closed off the railway crossings along its path. Wooden blocks were used to help reduce the speed of the train. Officials said that they are trying to identify the exact reason from the train's movement after it stopped at Katua to avoid such incidents in the future. And now on the market front, Japanese stocks keep powering higher. The Nikkei index began the week by hitting fresh record highs late this morning and it was up around half a percent comfortably above the 39,000 mark that came after last week saw the index surge past a peak not seen since late 1989. Japanese stocks have been boosted by factors including a weak yen which makes them cheaper for overseas buyers. Natixis senior economist Gary Ung says other factors are at play too with uncertainty over China's economic prospects starting to make Japan look more attractive. 
The latest gains follow an upside surprise on earnings from US AI chipmaker NVIDIA last week. That has fueled enthusiasm for tech stocks in general and helped propel US shares to record closing highs on Friday. Monday morning's top gainer in Tokyo was high-grade silicon maker Sumco, up around 6%, while industrial robot maker Fanuc saw gains of over 2%. Drug makers also did well, with Chugai Pharmaceutical up as much as 5%. The conflict around the axis of resistance continues as the Houthi military said on Sunday that they targeted an American oil tanker in the Gulf of Aden in solidarity with the Palestinians in Gaza. Here's a look. In a televised speech, a military spokesman for the Iran-backed Houthis, Yahya Sarraya, said their navy targeted the U.S.-flagged, owned and operated commercial ship MV Tom Thor, while the Air Force targeted American warships in the Red Sea with drones. The Yemeni armed forces will not stop unless the aggression stops and the siege on the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip is lifted, he said. The U.S. Central Command said in a statement on X, its forces shot down an anti-ship ballistic missile that was likely targeting the oil tanker, adding that the vessel was not damaged. The United States and Britain have redesignated the Houthis as a terrorist group after they began targeting commercial vessels in November to protest Israel's war on Gaza. The U.S. has carried out near-daily strikes against the Houthis, but have so far failed to halt the attacks, which have upset global trade and raised shipping rates. Still on that story, the United States and Britain carried out yet another round of large-scale military strikes overnight against multiple sites in Houthi-controlled Yemeni areas, with civilian targets, including a pesticide factory, being hit in the joint strikes for the first time, as well as air defense systems. For more on this, we have other than the world special correspondent Natasha Lowe from the UK for more. Natasha? Yes, I'm ready. Britain's Defence Ministry released a video on Saturday that showed Typhoon fighter jets and Voyager tanker aircraft in operation for the latest round of joint military action. According to the US Central Command, the US and British forces struck 18 Houthi military targets in Yemen in air strikes. One pesticide factory, located in the western part of the capital, was severely ravaged after being hit three times in air strikes with ropes of some buildings blown off and walls blown down. The strikes also affected nearby residential buildings with windows shattered and walls down, plunging the entire neighborhood into a state of terror. Multiple civilian targets were hit for the first time, sparking fears among the local population that the US and Britain are broadening their targets to include civilian infrastructure. This potential shift is raising concerns about further economic devastation and deepening humanitarian crisis in the region. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Natasha Lowe from the UK. We're now into the second week since thousands of doctors in South Korea resigned in protest against the government's medical school quota hike over in South Korea. The healthcare standoff doesn't seem like it will end anytime soon. More med school graduates and fellows are now considering joining the nationwide strike to stop the medical shortage crisis from exacerbating. The South Korean Interior Minister also said that the government would not hold doctors accountable if they return to their posts by February 29th. Now it's new medical school graduates who are set to join the nation's large-scale trainee doctor strike by refusing to take internships. Hospitals have been scrambling, relying on attending physicians and professors to step in to fill medical service gaps left by a mass exodus of trainee doctors that began last Tuesday. However, the healthcare crisis is poised to deepen with medical school graduates turning down intern positions. According to Seoul National University Hospital, 80 to 90 percent of interns due to start on March 1st haven't signed their contracts. While at Busan National University Hospital in Busan, all 50 internship candidates slated to start Friday have resigned. Fellows are also contemplating joining the collective action by not renewing their contracts. Attending and fellow doctors from around 80 university hospitals nationwide issued a statement last week where they said that practicing medicine has become untenable amid vilification by the public. The staffing shortage has forced major Seoul hospitals to cut surgeries and treatments by up to half. 
So far, nearly 80 percent of the nation's 13-thousand trainee doctors from 94 major hospitals have resigned. As of Monday, Samsung Medical Center reduced its surgery schedule by 45 to 50 percent. Seoul Asan Hospital initially scaled back surgeries by 30 to 40 percent during the first week of the strike, but has now decided to reduce them further to 40 to 50 percent. Other hospitals like St. Mary's Hospital and Seoul National University Hospital have also adjusted their surgery schedules in response to the strike. As the strike wave spreads, the nation's interior minister Lee Sang-min said in a briefing on Monday that the government would not hold doctors accountable if they return to work by February 29th. He also urged doctors to engage in dialogue with the government for better medical service conditions. In the meantime, the Korean Medical Association has called for an immediate halt to the government's expansion plans, warning of legal action. Arguing such a move would not only compromise the quality of medical education, the KMA said the entire medical sector will fight back using every legal means available until the end. Meanwhile, the KMA is planning a massive rally in Yeoido on the third of the next month, with 20,000 doctors expected to attend. The heat seems to be more than just an annoyance as danger levels have risen in Australia due to wildfires. Firefighters are now racing against time to stop an out-of-control bushfire burning northwest of Ballarat. For more on this, we have other than the world news special correspondent Binet Sami Ratna from Melbourne in Australia. For more, Binet. Yes, I'm Ravi. Australia's Prime Minister Anthony Albanese pledged to provide whatever support needed to assist Victoria State in a days-long wildfire emergency that has raised homes after authorities warned extreme heat could fan the blazes this week. More than 15 bushfires were burning in Australia, according to emergency authorities. Around 1,000 firefighters, supported by more than 50 aircrafts, have battled the fires since they started. The emergency has killed livestock, destroyed at least six homes, and forced more than 2,000 people to leave western towns and head to the city of Ballarat, 60 miles west to the state capital Melbourne. Australia is in the grips of an El Nino weather pattern, which is typically associated with extreme phenomena such as wildfires, cyclones and droughts. Victoria's Emergency Services Minister announced that 228 impact assessments were carried out following fires in western Victoria and said hot temperature forecasts for Wednesday were now the main focus for authorities. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Binet Samiratna from Melbourne in Australia. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The SAG Awards nominations provided an exciting blend of usual suspects and stunning omissions. For some awards season strategists, particularly the ones behind critically adored films like Anatomy of a Fall and May-December, there's no choice but to ask what happened. Here's a short recap of some key moments of the show. The SAG Awards Pearl Anniversary Board expected mentions for Oscar contenders such as the two summers mash hits Barbie and Oppenheimer, leading the tally for all the movies with four nominations each. In addition, the crime epic Killers of the Flower Moon and the strategical dramedy American Fiction managed three mentions. After winning multiple trophies at the Golden Globes, Critics' Choice Awards and Emmys last month, for its third and final season, Succession, which led the SAG Awards TV knots with five, seemed like the likely big winner heading into the Saturday show. But instead, the HBO drama only took home one award, albeit for the top TV prize of the Best Drama Ensemble. Killers of the Flower Moon had a solid showing with the ensemble and actors Lily Gladstone and Robert De Niro recognised, but DiCaprio was casualty of highly competitive lead actor race. Oppenheimer continued its dominance of awards season as it scored several major prizes. Christopher Nolan's film won Best Film Cast, while Killian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. won individual acting prizes. Accepting the top prize on behalf of the cast, Sir Kenneth Bernard said that they were grateful and humble and proud. Indeed, Oppenheimer, which went into the SAG Awards up for four prizes, only lost in one category. However, Barbie did not win any of the four awards which was nominated, despite going into the SAG Awards with many nominations as Oppenheimer. The evening was peppered with remarks about the actor's strike, which brought Hollywood to a standstill last year. 
And finally tonight, five Iberian lynxes were released into the wilds of southern Spain. Because of poaching and the loss of much of their natural habitat, the Iberian lynx was on the brink of extinction in the early 2000s. In 2002, Portugal had lost its entire population and Spain only had 94. Now though, we can rest assured that the leaping felines will find a safe haven in nature once again. This small leap is a huge jump for an entire species. They are living proof that conservation programs can work. Breeding programs started, aimed at making sure the feline with the distinctive tufted ears survive for more generations. And it started to work. The International Union for Conservation of Nature downgraded the Iberian lynx's threat level to endangered from critically endangered in 2015. These five lynx are a result of one of those breeding programs. By releasing them to live freely in the mountains of Granada, Spain, animal experts hope they will reproduce and expand the population further. Approximately 1,000 lynx were counted in Portugal and Spain in 2020. That's a good start, but to be considered non-endangered, the WWF says there needs to be at least 3,000 Iberian lynx, which is why the conservation community is celebrating even five more lynx leaping out into the wild. One small pounce for lynx, one giant leap for lynx kind, I guess. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again next time with more updates on the happenings of the world. Have a good night.